Well, hello and welcome to our fifth webinar. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen is a radiation oncologist and serves as professor and genitourinary disease center lead of radiation oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Nguyen's clinical research focuses on the optimal use of systemic therapy with radiation for high-risk prostate cancer, and through these efforts has led multi-center randomized clinical trials, including the Formula 509 and the ENZARAD trials, which makes him well-suited for our webinar today on the role of genomics in high-risk localized therapy. Welcome, Dr. Nguyen. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah. My name is Ryan Didamore, and I'll be the host of this webinar. I'll provide an overview of Decipher and our genomic tests, and Dr. Nguyen will review the clinical data supporting therapy decisions utilizing genomics in newly diagnosed high-risk prostate cancer. We'll then walk through some patient case scenarios to illustrate the possible clinical treatment paths available by using Decipher testing for high-risk prostate cancer. To start off the webinar, we have a few short polls for you. The first is to get a better understanding of the specialty of the audience. So you should see a poll show up right now asking you your specialty. Uh, if you can please go ahead and click on that poll and submit the poll as um, that appears. We'll give a couple more uh, seconds for you to vote. If you can please uh, select your specialty. Great, let's go ahead and close out that poll. Looks like primarily radiation oncologists uh, with a few urologists as well joining. The next poll is on your experiences utilizing genomics in prostate cancer. If you can please launch that poll. It's just a simple question if you've used Decipher, uh, yes or no, in your past ex clinical experience. Great, so it looks like predominantly most people have some experience, about uh, two thirds have used Decipher. Uh, let's go ahead and, and close out that poll. And the last poll um, to start off with, have you utilized Decipher to optimize duration of ADT? Uh, Decipher has many uses. Um, some of them have to do with decisions to treat or not treat, others with the timing of radiation therapy. Uh, but today we'll be talking about the duration, utilizing it for the duration of ADT. Okay, it looks like uh, only about a third of the folks online have used it for monitor, um, altering the duration of ADT. So thank you for voting. Let's go ahead and close that out and we'll begin. For those of you who are new to Decipher, we provide genomic testing exclusively for prostate and bladder cancers, utilizing our CAP accredited, CLIA validated, and New York State certified clinical laboratory. Using this laboratory, we analyze biopsies and radical prostatectomy specimens. Specifically, we interrogate the tumor's whole transcriptome to provide the Decipher score. To date, we have processed over 90,000 prostate cancer samples. As a company focused exclusively within urologic cancers, we have made a deep investment in the clinical development of our tests within prostate and bladder cancers. And as such, are involved in over 110 clinical trials or studies. And as it says in the top right corner, we have been designated by the state of California as an essential business and are open and accepting patient samples. The lab is running six days a week. So if you have any samples of interest, please send them along. We have two categories of Decipher tests, the Decipher prostate biopsy, which is intended for newly diagnosed patients and utilizes the needle core biopsy. For the biopsy test, we are covered by CMS and Medicare for NCCS, NCCN risk indications. These include very low risk, low risk, favorable intermediate risk, unfavorable intermediate risk. And as we've been promising over the last webinars, we are now happy to say we've obtained Medicare coverage for Decipher across all localized disease, which we, means we are now also covered for high, very high, and lymph node positive prostate cancer. Our biopsy tests informs on active surveillance and dependent of therapy strategies. Our Decipher our prostate RP is for decisions post-op, both to inform on early radiation therapy decisions, as well as decisions incorporating the use of radiation therapy with or without ADT in the salvage clinical setting. Additionally, our products are in the NCCN guidelines broadly for most all clinical scenarios as indicated. Additionally, this year in the 2020 NCCN guidelines, our Decipher RP test was elevated to a recommend status. And to our knowledge, this is the first time a molecular diagnostic test has been recommended for localized prostate cancer in the NCCN guidelines. And we're excited about the adoption of Decipher tests within the standard of care. With the new Medicare expansion, we are very pleased with Medicare's acknowledgement that the Decipher test is aimed at aiding clinical questions independent of clinical and pathologic described patients. 
In the past, Medicare's coverage for the Decipher test was focused towards NCCN risk groups, confining Decipher use to specific risk groups or pathologically described features. However, with our continued effort on the clinical development of our Decipher test to inform decision-making across numerous clinical decisions, the new Medicare coverage is directed at encouraging Decipher testing to inform on improving clinical decision-making. As you can see, the test is now covered not by NCCN risk groups, but across a number of clinical decisions, including decisions around conservative management or active surveillance versus definitive treatment, the addition of brachytherapy boost to radiation therapy, the addition of short course or of ADT, decisions between short and long course ADT, addition of next generation AR signaling inhibitors or chemotherapy, and finally for post-op decisions on early radiation therapy or addition of ADT to radiation therapy in the salvage setting. Decipher was trained and validated to predict which patients were at an increased risk of an early metastatic event. The test was developed utilizing the Mayo Clinic tumor registry where we examined the tumor tissue from 639 patients who had been treated and followed for metastasis Utilizing machine learning of 46,000 genes, we identified 22 genes across seven cancer pathways, which generated the Decipher algorithm, which provides the Decipher score from zero to one, where patients from zero to 0 0.45 are at low risk, 0 0.45 to 0 0.6 with intermediate risk, and 0 0.6 to 1.0 at a high genomic risk for an early metastatic event. The Decipher score has subsequently been validated as a continuous biomarker in dozens of cohorts composing of tens of thousands of patients. On the bottom row, you can see the decipher testing process, where we start with the tumor biopsy or prostatectomy specimen. We then extract the RNA, prepare the cDNA, and hybridize to a whole transcriptome array. The output is a personalized decipher risk score. As you know, high-risk prostate cancer is a critically important segment of prostate cancer, and this population makes up the largest segment of patients diagnosed with localized disease who will die from prostate cancer. Consequently, our treatment for high-risk disease often includes extensive hormonal therapy along with local therapy to ensure an opportunity for curative intent. However, not all high-risk disease is the same and certainly not all patients are the same. So we asked 50 community providers, a combination of urologists and radiation oncologists who frequently treat prostate cancer, as to which high-risk patient high-risk prostate cancer patients, they are most likely to consider a shorter course of ADT versus the standard of care two years of ADT. Essentially, which patients are on the bubble uh, between a more traditional high-risk prostate cancer and a disease more similar to an intermediate-risk prostate cancer. A considerable number of providers identified patients who were classified solely by PSA but had otherwise less risky pathology. So pathology uh, that had either Gleason grades six or seven, uh, but had a PSA over 20. Similarly, concern over lower volume or lower grade high-risk tumors. Um, patients, for example, with Gleason A, but had more favorable high risk, that being either uh, T1C and lower PSA or only one core of Gleason 8 disease. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Nguyen. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And thanks everyone for tuning in here. I see I'm logging, I see uh, 67 people logged in, which is pretty cool. And in these crazy COVID times, it's nice to even be able to connect with people virtually uh, from my own home here. So I um, hope everyone is doing well today. So these are my disclosures. Um, you see them up on the screen. I think the, the key thing is that uh, Decipher is not one of my disclosures. So I'm not getting paid to give this talk uh, today. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So, you know, now Decipher has been approved for uh, use in high-risk prostate cancer. And, and the real question is sort of like, what do we do with it? So that's what I hope to touch upon today. Um, we can get through these slides reasonably quickly. This is, you know, as everyone knows, there have been trials that have de demonstrated a modest benefit of ADT. These are some of the original trials focused mainly on intermediate risk, but also a few high risk patients. You can go next slide. Um, but when we talk about high risk prostate cancer, the trials have really suggested that we should be thinking about long term hormone therapy. This, of course, is the 9202, suggesting 28 months is better than four months. And the DART trial, which was the repeat of this trial, but with dose escalated modern radiation, again showing that 28 months was better than four months, improving overall survival for men with high risk prostate cancer. You can do the next slide. But, you know, I, I think the, the question that we're all starting to ask now is should we be treating all high risk prostate cancers the same? I mean, we, I think we, we all know when you look at the guidelines, you can do radiation and two years of hormones, and they even give you some leeway to go 1.5 to three years, or even one year if you use a brachytherapy boost, which uh, I'm not really so sure we should go quite that short with the brachytherapy boost, but 
there there's kind of still a, a standard pattern for high risk prostate cancer. And um, I think a lot of us are sensing that, hey, there is a difference between high risk prostate cancer patients, not all are the same. So just like we split intermediate risk into favorable and unfavorable, there is now thinking that there could be a similar split for high risk. Can we do the next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, uh, a study done by uh, one of my former medical students, who's now a Harvard chief resident, Vinayak Muralidar, who published five years ago in the Red Journal uh, the idea that there could be a favorable high-risk prostate cancer subset, which um, we defined as a T1C Gleason 8 and a PSA less than 10. This is kind of the patient that is the product of the PSA screening era. It has like a low PSA and has like a couple of cores of Gleason 8 and, um, and T1C disease. And then also combine it with this other group of patients who have a Gleason 6 and a PSA greater than 20. Uh, standard high risk was defined as uh, most of the high risk patients, then very high risk picked up on this pattern that NCCN put out based on the Hopkins data of T3B to T4 or primary pattern five. And as you see on the curves on the right, basically those patients with uh, in, in green with um, standard high risk had a pretty high risk of uh, prostate cancer specific death, but those who had favorable high risk disease actually performed very similar to those with unfavorable intermediate risk disease. So this really is a different clinical entity, these favorable high risk patients, particularly the T1C, Gleason 8, and a PSA less than 10. And it kind of starts to get the mind thinking about whether we could even think about treating these patients differently. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then at the other extreme, of course, you've got the favorable intermediate. And here on the other end, I think Hopkins really was uh, one of the big pioneers in pushing this, the very high risk uh, end of prostate cancer, where these patients have a very high risk potentially of prostate cancer mortality. So I think two ends of high risk, uh, favorable, and then very high risk. And then there's the whole group in the middle. Next slide, please. Um, this is some work uh, we did as a multi-center collaboration. Um, working with the Decipher biopsy assay. So this looked at, you know, Decipher was set up as a radical prostatectomy assay, uh, but we combined with a few other centers to look at how it performed on biopsies. And it turned out it performs pretty well. It actually is able to predict long-term outcome um, whether you're getting radiation or surgery, um, which was very useful and gratifying to know. And as you can see on the left, it does better than the CAPRA or the NCCN um, risk groups to, to incorporate Decipher there. Next slide, please. And this is specifically looking at high risk patients. It does, uh, does include um, good prognostic information for high risk patients. As you can see on the right, um, when you have high risk patients and you stratify them by the Decipher score, you continue to get more information about how this patient is gonna do. Next slide, please. And there's even a subgroup of patients with high-risk disease who have low decipher scores uh, who were treated with radiation and six months of hormones. This is back in an older era when we used to treat all these patients with radiation and six months of hormones. But those who had the very low decipher score did very, very well, even though um, you know, some of them had high-risk disease. Next slide, please. And Dan Spratt did this beautiful paper in the JCO a couple of years ago, basically talking about whether we could incorporate decipher genomics into the NCCN risk groups to come up with new risk groups that take into account both the clinical factors from the NCCN D'Amico risk group, and then add in the decipher score, um, and then combine those to make new risk groups that factor in a little bit of the clinical and a little bit of the genomic to come up with new risk groups that incorporate both and then hopefully are actually better at discriminating outcome. Um, and as you can see, for example, with this scoring system, he created a scoring system where uh, you get points. So for the NCCN risk group, you get zero for low, one for favorable intermediate, two for unfavorable intermediate, three for high or very high. And then you add to that your decipher score, zero for low, one for intermediate and two for high. And then when you add those two up, you get new um, combined genomic and clinical risk groups, zero to one for low, two to three for intermediate and four to five to high. And on the next slide, you'll see how these um, were actually able to predict outcome better than the current NCCN risk groups, which makes sense. Um, when you add genomic information, in this case, decipher to NCCN risk groups, you're going to do better than NCCN risk groups alone. All right, next slide, please. 
And this is just getting back to the idea of should we be lengthening the duration of hormone therapy for all patients with high risk disease? And we, you know, we treat them all the same. Um, but this kind of looks at what was the actual benefit of lengthening from four to 28 months or six to 36 months in these trials. And actually it was pretty modest. So the 10 year benefit of going from four to 28 months is only 5% prostate cancer mortality. Uh, the five-year benefit of going from six to 36 months was 3.8% overall survival. Uh, another trial, uh, the Australian trial looking at six versus 18 had a 3% prostate cancer specific mortality benefit and 18 versus 36 had a 0% overall survival difference. And so the, the benefit of going longer, while it's there, while it's real, and I, I believe it's real, um, the, the magnitude of it is pretty small. And so this, I think, opens up the idea, the opportunity, the question of can we use genomics to try to reduce the ADT duration for, for these men uh, with the lower portion of genomic risk? And we think that these patients are actually unlikely to be in that 3 to 5% of patients who benefit from going to standard long-term ADT. So this is a hypothesis. This is not um, fact, this is not standard of care, but this is a, you know, this is a hypothesis and a, question, and a question that I think is worth asking. Um, can we do the next slide, please? So um, this is a trial that uh, we will be launching. This is an NRG cooperative group trial called the PredictRT trial that really tries to ask this kind of question, which is, can we use genomics and in this case, the deciphered test to personalize therapy for men with high-risk prostate cancer. This trial uh, has been approved and it's just kind of going through one final amendment and should be open, uh, I would think, by the end of the year. So if you're an RTOG or NRG site, uh, you should be getting this trial to open soon and would love to have your support on this. So here's how the trial works. It takes NCCN high-risk patients, everybody gets a decipher score, and those with the bottom two-thirds of decipher scores. Um, so those in the lower two-thirds of risk among the high-risk patients are going to be put into a de-intensification study where they'll be randomized to radiation plus 24 months of hormones, which is the standard, versus radiation and 12 months of hormones. So the idea is can you cut back to just 12 months for these men who have uh, who are in the bottom two-thirds of decipher genomic risk among the high-risk patients? Whereas for that patients who have a deciphered genomic risk that puts them into the upper one-third or who have node positive disease, here we want to be thinking about intensification. So the randomization will be radiation and two years of hormones plus or minus abiraterone and apalutamide. So this trial would really be using Decipher to figure out which arm you get or, or which trial you get randomized in and whether you get randomized to a de-intensification question for the lower genomic risk or an intensification question for the higher genomic risk. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out uh, to Oliver Sartor, uh, who's also a PI, and uh, Dr. Felix Feng, who's the GU group chair, um, who made this trial happen. Um, okay, so this trial will exist out there. And, and next, we want to talk about some scenarios about what to do with patients today. Can we do the next slide, please, Ryan? Great. Uh, maybe I can introduce the patient. So, Dr. Nguyen, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, features of a common patient that we see here at Decipher. So, in this case, this is a patient 71 years old, Gleason grade group 4, 3 of 12 cores positive, but really only has one core with about 10%, 4 plus 4. PSA is, is somewhat normal or, or low for this high-risk group, uh, 8.5, normal prostate volume, T1C, pyrads of 4. Um, so, it's classified as an NCCN high-risk and just curious on how you would uh, look at this patient. Yeah, Ryan, so this is that kind of patient that I think we all feel a little bit bad for. Um, this is a patient who had an elevated PSA and had core biopsies and just Dr. Nguyen, I think we might have lost just one of them out of three happened to be called Gleason 4 plus 4. Um, can you hear me now, Ryan? Yeah, I think you, you've, you, you've paused uh, there. Ryan, can second. you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. Now. You got me now? Yeah. Okay. When's the, all if right. Just, what, when is the last uh, um, nugget of truth that I, I didn't get? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, yeah. sorry to, uh, to everyone for the, you know, I pay for the good. I'm just going to tell everyone, all my friends at home right now, I pay for the good Wi-Fi, like the Wi-Fi that's like, uh, like 940 MIPS and mm -hmm. I've got Orbeez all over the place. And yet I still have these, these knockouts. So anybody that knows how to fix this, just, just uh, put it in the chat and I'll be very grateful. Um, 
but it's not for not paying for the good Wi-Fi, I'll tell you that. Um, so anyway, talking about this patient, I think this is the kind of patient that we all feel bad for. It's just, he's just got one core of Gleason 8, and you know, you see he's got four plus three and three plus four, so it's almost like the luck of the draw of exactly where that needle landed, and in this case, it landed right in the middle of the four, so he's got a core that's all four. Um, it's pretty low volume, his PSA is low, and it's T1C, and so I think we all feel a little bad treating this patient with two years of hormones, but I mean, that's the standard of care. I'm not, I'm not arguing with that. Um, but as you can see, the, the study that Benayak did, these are the kind of favorable high-risk patients who do perform pretty much like uh, unfavorable intermediate risk in terms of their survival. Um, we have another slide. Um, yes. Yes. Maybe I'll just kind of introduce the decipher results. This patient comes back with a decipher low risk, so a score of 0.32 and having even lower risk of METs and prostate cancer specific death than um, what was presented in the last publication. So I guess given the favorable high risk disease and the decipher low risk score, can you discuss the clinical options? Yeah, so you know this is very reassuring. Um, everything kind of lines up. So if you think of like uh, you know the Dan Spratt risk groups, this is a patient with high risk prostate cancer, but we could already tell from the clinical features that um, this disease isn't that aggressive. And reassuringly, the genomic score lines up with this. This is genomic low risk. Um, and so, as, you know, as you can see, it's only a 1.7% risk of metastasis within five years, 2.6% risk of death within 10 years. Um, this is the kind of patient that currently the NCCN guidelines says to treat with radiation and 18 to 36 months of hormones. Um, and that's really what the, uh, the PREDICT-RT trial is trying to get at. So I would say, you know, if you if you run this kind of patient um, and you have the trial open, if you're an NRG site, um, would certainly love for you to enroll in Predict RT, where we could formally test this question of radiation in two years of hormones versus radiation in one year of hormone for this kind of patient. But what if the trial is not accessible? You know, what are you going to do? You've got the patient in front of you. We all know that it's hard to get a patient to two years of hormones, and in fact. You know, we did a study showing that when you um, try to get somebody to, to two years of hormones, it's something like uh, almost uh, two thirds don't actually get there. So um, it, we recognize that it's pretty difficult. And I think for this kind of patient, although it's not standard of care, I mean, this is where realistically, you know, you might not push so hard to get to two years where you, you might think maybe it's OK to, to, to pull back a little bit. You know, like I said, that's not current standard of care, but when you've got the patient in front of you, you've got these favorable characteristics and they already have favorable clinical risk. You know, even without the genomic factors, things already look pretty favorable. And now you add the genomic information on top of that and things look very favorable. You know, I think in my heart, this kind of patient would probably be okay with the shorter duration of ADT. Um, of course, to get guidelines changed, we're going to have to test that. And that's why the PREDICT RT trial is open. So let's go to a, a different type of patient. Um, so this is kind of more of a traditional high-risk patient, 68 years old, uh, has pattern five, so grade group five, three of 12, 12 course positive, PSA uh, just over 10 at 11 and a half, uh, normal prostate volume, T2A uh, with pyrids five. Um, so classified as NCCN high risk. Yeah, so this is a patient who's got the real deal high risk. Um, you know, they've got Gleason nine, uh, PSA is above 10, something's palpable. So, you know, it's not the worst of the worst. I think if we had an MRI that also showed uh, extra capsular extension or seminal vesicle invasion, that really would be the worst of the worst of the worst. Um, but this is still pretty serious disease. I mean, at, at the very least, this sits in with with the rest of the, the, the standard high-risk patients and even uh, heading towards the, uh, towards the very high risk, but not quite there. Um, so for this patient, uh, you know, for sure I'd want to do the the two years of hormones, um, and we don't want to be skimping with anything there. Um, in terms of intensification options, we don't really have much. I wouldn't recommend it as standard of care. I mean, I think people know about uh, the docetaxel study, which um, hasn't quite shown uh, a survival advantage uh, on a two-sided p-value. So I, I don't think that that's really something I would typically reach for. But I think for this patient, typically I'd treat them, make sure they get the, the full two years of hormones. So the patient comes back uh, with a decipher that's very high risk, uh, 0.89. Um, and as you can see, uh, their METs and pro risk of 
risk of METS in prostate cancer specific death is actually much higher than the last slide had suggested with the risk of METS of 29 and risk of death in 10 years at 16%. Uh, maybe if you can discuss some of the clinical options and how this might um, change what you thought about the patient. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, this is uh, this this is very you know bad news. Um, 0.89 is a very high score, and I think it it you know as as seen here on the on the form, this patient has a very high risk of metastasis and a and a moderately high risk of prostate cancer death. So I think you know obviously we have to take this very seriously. Um, you know, and as we have listed over here, the the Predict RT trial does um, take these kinds of patients and puts them into the intensification trial where they would be randomized to either two years of hormones or two years of hormones plus two years of abiraterone and apalutamide. And I think this is exactly the kind of patient that should go on trial if possible. Um, but if you don't have the trial open, you don't have access to the trial, this is the kind of patient that I would make sure that I'm throwing the kitchen sink at. So this is the kind of patient for sure I'd be going two years of hormones. Um, I usually don't treat pelvic nodes so, you know, based on the, the data that's out there right now, um, I generally don't treat nodes, but for this kind of patient, I would treat the nodes prophylactically. And this is the kind of patient off protocol, for sure, I would be adding a brachytherapy boost. Um, you know, we all know from the Ascend-RT trial that brachytherapy boost hasn't um, changed survival yet, but uh, it significantly reduces the risk of recurrence, cuts it by 50%. And so this patient with such a high risk of recurrence and being a young man, I would want to give every single opportunity to reduce that risk of recurrence. And perhaps, given that his risk of metastasis is so high, maybe it'll actually translate into a difference in metastasis for this kind of super high risk patient. So this kind of patient I would throw the kitchen sink at, two years of hormones, uh, pelvic nodal radiation, brachy boost. And then I think this is the kind of patient that you want to keep a close eye on. Um, you know, when we're following these patients, there's a lot of latitude in the guidelines. You're going to follow them every every three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. But uh, I think this is the kind of patient you want to watch every every three to six because they could fail quickly. And uh, you want to get ahead of that failure and, and, you know, make sure that you can start early interventions um, if, if things start to go south for this patient. Great. So... Uh, thanks, Ryan. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, in, in terms of the take homes, what I hope people can take home is that um, high risk prostate cancer is pretty heterogeneous. It's not really a one size fits all kind of disease, but we do have a one size fits all treatment for it. And I think it'd be great in the future to be able to move away from that. And I think genomics really helps us to get there. Um, I think we've seen now that uh, these favorable high-risk patients who are the T1Cs with just Gleason 4 plus 4 equals 8 and a PSA less than 10 actually have very similar outcomes to unfavorable intermediate-risk patients. We've seen now that Decipher um, can prognosticate outcomes for patients with high-risk disease, whether they're getting radiation or surgery. Um, Predict RT is something that I hope that all of you will be able to open at your centers uh, because I think this is the trial that's going to really allow us to use genomics in the future to change guidelines, change treatment paradigms, and personalize therapy. We hope to be able to intensify therapy for those at the greatest risk of metastases because of their decipher score, and then de-intensify therapy for those who, because of their low decipher score, might behave much more favorably. Um, but I think, you know, look, what are we going to do now if you don't have access to the trial and you've got a patient in front of you? Um, for favorable high-risk patients with either a low or intermediate risk to cipher score based on what we've seen clinically, based on how the SPRAT data adds to that, um, you know, I think it wouldn't be wrong to consider a reduction of ADT duration depending on how they're tolerating it. Uh, I wouldn't consider that the standard, but... You know, I think with the patient in front of you and understanding the realities of how hard it is to keep them on ADT, these these are probably patients where it's a little bit safer to cut back a little bit. Whereas with high risk patients with high decipher scores, these patients, I would throw the kitchen sink at them. I'd add the pelvic nodes, add the brachy boost. Make sure you're going to those two years, full two years of hormones. Do not let them cut back, and then follow those patients really closely. That's what I'm going to do in my clinic. Great. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nguyen. And so if you have any questions for Dr. Nguyen, um, if you could please insert them into the question uh, section now. And while we with, wait for those questions um, to go up, we have one final poll um, that's given the presented data, how likely are you to consider decipher testing for patients diagnosed with 
high risk prostate cancer. Um, and you can select more than, than one option. So please go ahead and, and click on whatever um, options that you feel are, are most appropriate. And so please go ahead and, and submit those questions now. So uh, as those come in, um, we can go ahead and close out. Uh, well, let's like, actually give it the poll a couple more seconds here to let everybody vote. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and, and uh, start off with a few questions now they're starting to come in. Um, so it looks like we have a few questions on the addition of the brachy boost and, and kind of the decision that, you know, if we have a higher genomic risk, you mentioned that you would consider add, adding that, you know, what, you know, I guess what's driving to that and, and do you have any specific data that, that is relevant to that or is it um, just common that you've seen that in higher risk patients that, that that's been more beneficial? Yeah, I mean, what I'm thinking about there is what's their absolute risk of recurrence. From the AscendRT trial, we saw that there was a relative risk reduction of 50% in terms of biochemical recurrence when you added the brachytherapy boost. And so, um, and we know that there's not a survival benefit yet seen in the overall trial, and we know that there's uh, a toxicity to this. So, um, I think even in our group, there's some hesitation to do it across the board. I, I happen to be a fan of brachytherapy boost, um, but you know, not everyone does it across the board. So what I think about is who's the patient who's likely to get the most benefit out of this 50% relative risk reduction? Well, it's gonna be a patient who has the highest risk of recurring. Um, now you might say, well, you know, maybe what Decipher is telling us is the risk of getting a distant metastasis. And so maybe the brachytherapy boost won't help that because brachytherapy boost is what helps with local control. But um, what we're thinking about here is that this might be a patient where um, maximizing local control could prevent that distant metastasis down the road. So that's the hope. I'm kind of thinking about this is a kind of patient who has a very high risk of recurrence. And so we can get the most benefit out of that 50% relative risk of PSA failure, and hopefully that'll translate into a metastasis benefit. So um, this is the kind of patient where even though there's not a proven survival benefit yet, I would give them the benefit of the doubt and try to throw the kitchen sink at them to maximize the chance that they don't recur. Great. And then um, a question on um, PET imaging. Obviously, with the world changing a little bit and we expect uh, PSMA PET uh, and Axiom is already out there. Um, would do you think that for these high risk patients, and we obviously don't know what the approval for for these pets will be within the high risk space? Do you, do you think there's a role in genomic testing and helping to identify who may need to be pet imaged? Yeah, uh, you know, I I totally think so. I think um, you know, as everyone knows, um, so far Aximan imaging has been approved in the um, in the post-op or, or, or recurrent space, and um, we haven't been able to do it routinely in the upfront high risk space, but we, I think we all suspect that these are patients who could be harboring micrometastatic disease, and we'd love to be able to scan them and then um, figure out how to treat them in a more personalized fashion. And, I, you know, I think to the extent that these tests are not going to be uh, universally available and to the extent that they're going to cost money, we've got to figure out which patients we're going to be giving them to. So um, I would use genomics as a way to prioritize which patients I would be getting uh, PSMA or try to get an Aximan scan for. Um, now, if they're just available for everyone and they're, you know, given out willy-nilly, then fine, maybe we don't need to select so much. But I think in the near future, it's still likely that we are going to need to select. I think genomics is a very um, rational way to try to select and identify those patients who might benefit the most from this kind of imaging. Okay. Uh, and for the PredictRT trial, there's a question on um, if there are specific radiation therapy regimens that are required for the study, or is there, there a fair amount of freedom, um, such as adding the brachy boost or uh, the public node radiation? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So PredictRT is going to be a, 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 a a huge trial in the sense that it needs about 2,500 patients to enroll, um, which is a, a huge number of patients. And so in order to do that across the United States, we've made it as permissive as possible. So the radiation is very permissive. You'll see lots of different regimens. You should see your favorite regimen in there. You, you'll see 
um, uh, moderate hypofractionation, you'll see standard fractionation, you'll see SBRT, you'll see pelvic nodes, you'll see no pelvic nodes, you'll see uh, brachytherapy boost. Um, I think it's possible even SBRT boost is in there, but I'll have to double check. Um, but th there are a lot of uh, radiation options in there um, to really try to make it as easy as possible for people to enroll. Okay. And then here's a question. Um, I'm usually uh, radical prostatectomies for high-risk patients are, tend to be on the younger patients, but do you see a role in genomic testing and, and particularly the decipher test in, in helping to maybe triage that decision of, you know, uh, someone who may be younger who is on the fence between surgery and radiation? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm, I'm personally of the firm belief that if you look at the data uh, for a high-risk prostate cancer and actually across the board, uh, the survival outcomes with radiation and surgery, good radiation, versus surgery are going to be the same. So if you do proper hormone therapy, uh, maybe if you add a brachy boost to a high-risk patient, you should get the same survival outcomes. So, um, and, and that's backed up not only by tons of retrospective data, but also a, a randomized trial, although it was underpowered. This is a, the Leonard Noss randomized trial, um, definitely underpowered, but in terms of prostate cancer mortality, exactly the same. So I would say that for these patients, these high-risk patients, especially young patients, I would get that score. I think it, you know, should help them make their treatment decision. Um, but specifically between surgery and radiation, I'm not sure that it would necessarily push me one way or another because I think uh, we can get um, pretty pretty strong cancer control rates either way. Great. And and I just get, there's a question in a, on the you know, testing versus enrollment, which I, I think we had discussed previously, which is, is essentially if you have patients now in the community um, you or at energy sites, you test them um, as you would with any other type of patient that you would test for Decipher. And then essentially using that result, um, you can enter the trial and have the, those physician-based, uh, physician-to-patient-based discussions. Um, is, is that is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah. So thanks for asking that question. So yeah, you could you could run your own clinical decipher test. So we don't want to slow you down in any way in terms of enrolling on the trial. So if you have a high risk patient in front of you, and you just want to run the clinical decipher, you can go ahead and do that, uh, and then enroll them on the trial. And they don't need a repeat decipher. They can just use that clinical decipher. Alternatively, you could just meet your high risk patient and say you want to enroll them on the trial right away. Then the trial will run the decipher test. Uh, for you. So uh, either way is fine. Those are two ways to get into the trial, either decipher uh, ahead of time on your own or decipher as part of the trial. Great. Uh, looks like that is uh, about all the questions. Uh, maybe one, one last question um, with regards to you know, decipher results uh, uh, related to standard of care ADT duration um, that have come in. Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, there's been a number of different studies with looking at decipher results in patients who've either not gotten uh, ADT or have gotten ADT. Do you have any comments on relationship of results to outcomes? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I do find um, compelling the data that folks like Dan Spratt and others have put together that show that when you've got high risk disease and a low decipher score, you seem to perform um, like a like a more like a, an unfavorable intermediate risk patient. We saw that with the clinical data. Dan combined it with the genomic data and, and showed that, which was really nice. Um, I think that being said, it's still technically um, unknown whether it's completely okay to treat those patients um, with shorter durations of hormone therapy. Technically, the standard still is two years, but um, you know, I think we all have patients in front of us where we look at their disease and their clinical characteristics, and technically it's high risk, but we know that their risk of actually dying is not that high. Then you get the genomic score from Decipher, and you know that the risk isn't that high. And then you see that they're miserable with the hormone therapy, and it's very hard for them to keep up with it for some reason or other. Maybe they're old, or maybe they're young, and they're having a very hard time with it. And I think for that kind of patient, um, having those two bits of information, the kind of the favorable clinical characteristics and the favorable decipher score, I think should give us some comfort in um, reducing the duration of ADT for those patients, even though it's not yet standard and we need the PREDICT-RT trial to prove that. Um, with the patient in front of you, 
under these circumstances, um, you know, I think it makes sense to think about cutting back a little bit if the patient's having a tough time with it. Great. I think it's a great place to end. So I want to thank everybody who's attended. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen, for your time and, and counsel. And we're excited to see the progress of, of this study and obviously the adoption uh, of people getting tested in, in uh, the high-risk space. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining. And please uh, keep in touch as we'll uh, have this webinar series continuing. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, and uh, encourage you to enroll. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.